the stem cells from an unborn fetus, the mother's going to have an abortion anyway, has the abortion, and rather than discard that fetus, they harvest the stem cell. We look at one of the most divisive issues in America, abortion. We have to bomb and torch clinics, so be it. The deadly shooting rampage at a Planned Parenthood clinic. What bothers me is the anti-abortion people. If their kid was sick, or their kid had a disease, if they were any type of parent, they'd be knocking everybody out in line to be the first one here. And there's no doubt about it. And I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any one of them. When someone dies, that they choose to donate their organs to give life. I think in collecting stem cells, it's a great way of just giving life. The way I feel about it is those babies are going to get aborted anyways. That's the way I feel. Might as well make God made something readily available. If you're going to have an abortion, don't waste what can save someone's life. I, I don't want you to have an abortion, but if you're going to, don't waste. And, and people need to realize that the availability of where, wherever it comes from um, is it, it, God's will. Another laboratory has reduced their effort on studies that require fetal tissues, despite the importance of this research, due to concerns about personal safety. The significance of fetal tissue research has been reiterated by other leading research institutions, including Harvard, the Yale School of Medicine, and the University of Minnesota. stem cells, fetal stem cells, ever become widely used, it will change the entire profit picture of the pharmaceutical industry. Because they don't make their money on well people, they make their money on sick people. And uh, continually pumping drugs of all kinds into them. That is how the medical profession survives, on drugs. I have not had one pain episode the first time in 18 years. I am totally pain free and medication free. The people who have an illness who are going to be dead in 12 to 15 years should have an alternative to sit on the sidelines and wait for a triple blind placebo flop it, flop it, you know, experiment. There should be something else. That's, it's thick that we know how to help people and cure illness, and we can't do it. So we realized there was nothing that mainstream medicine had. We've been to absolutely every doctor we possibly could. It's, it's so exciting. For the it's first strong. time, I see the light in the end of the tunnel. I see a light. We can ease your dying with medicine. And that's not something I wanted to hear. So going to a different country for treatment sounds a lot better than that. I was very skeptical, very skeptical. It's helped me tremendously with just one treatment. I've gone from middle school, I've had, and then high school as well, almost flunking, staying up till two in the morning with my parents, just so they could help me because I couldn't even do it myself. Till now I'm making straight A's and B's, uh, which is phenomenal. So you're saying in the four month time that you're making better grades than you've ever had? Yeah, actually beneficial, yeah, absolutely. Without taking medication now, Vyvanse, ADHD, um, Adderall. She was diagnosed with a rare form of uh, muscular dystrophy. After the very first treatment, within that next week, she went from falling 15 to 20 times a day down to no times. She doesn't fall anymore. Her gait was really wobbly all over the place, and now she's walked super straight to be able to walk in a straight line. Something is working well for you. Something is working well for me, and I'm not doing anything else, so. What's important is that it is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and that it hasn't progressed and that you're not sick. Which is why once a year, like an insurance policy, I go back and get the stem cells. I've never seen anything quite like this, I gotta be honest. If I had the best, I, I would never think 
anything like this would work. I haven't seen anybody get this well. What can I tell you except that we're looking at a 20th century miracle. And you wouldn't let him walk without assistance. So look where we are today. So do you mind if I uh, shoot, film you a little Go ahead bit? and film it. I'm still an emeritus associate professor in chemical engineering and adjunct professor in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. I also have Parkinson's disease. Tell me, tell me how, uh, what, how you feel about today. I can tell the difference from the time that I first started getting the treatment. How do you feel about the fact that you have to, that this isn't available like readily in the States, like in the opinion? Um, in my opinion, based on what I know about it now, I think it's criminal. You're looking, you're looking really good. How do you feel? I'm feeling much better. Yeah? Yeah, yeah I mean, like, is your natural setting up really good? Right. Yeah. How do you feel now? As far as a, a lot better. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better. That's, that's amazing. I'm not trembling so much. In terms of the evolution of medicine, if you think about the 20th century, we turned chemistry to the service of medicine. That is, we learned how to deliver small molecules as drugs. But if we can learn how to deliver cells as medicines, and actually repair and regenerate these degenerating tissues will have a major impact on medicine. I think it's inevitable. There are many different types of stem cells. The ones we hear most about are embryonic stem cells, umbilical cord stem cells, and adult stem cells. These different stem cell types should not be confused with one another as they are not all created equal, nor are they the focus of this stem cell story. Instead, for this journey, we focused on fetal stem cells, arguably the most contested and controversial form of stem cell therapy to date. I'm just trying to think, I don't know how to just start talking. Um, it's, a lot to tell you over one sitting, you know, it's, I don't know, it's hard. I see kids in wheelchairs in my doctor's appointments and I think, wow, I'm lucky. And then I see kids in high school and I think, wow, I got the short end of the stick. I don't do the things that I used to anymore. I don't really leave the house at all, because it, it's hard. I mean, I live on my couch and in my kitchen and in my room, and I don't choose to. I don't, I don't mean to ignore my friends because I don't want to hang out with them because it's hard to. I don't go to music shows like I used to because that's something I'm really passionate about. And that's the only thing that I cared about and I can't even get up the stairs without having to sit and catch hold of myself because my heart beats extremely fast and I feel like I'm about to pass out. Because now what they're offering us <clears throat> as far as his cystic fibrosis team is um, a double lung transplant, which, you know, the horrors of that, I can only imagine. Um, I know my son does not want that. The, I, and there's no guarantee with that either. No, they even said that, you know, there's some people who go through it and wish that they didn't. Lung transplant is where you need to go. If you think about it, we can ease your dying with medicine. And that's not something I wanted to hear. So going to a different country for treatment sounds a lot better than that. I've started visualizing going over the border of Mexico and I've started fantasizing about the results. He's 21 years old and he should be out living his life and dating and having a job and going to school or whatever he wants to do. He pretty much just exists in this house. It's really hard for me. And then when we found out that there is another option, once that was totally realized, then I remember being pissed. Yeah, mad. Yeah. Why? That this is not available, readily available to us. Mm -hmm. It's not talked about. Okay, we're all done. That's it.
People living with cystic fibrosis most always experience a steady worsening of their disease with time. Yet, Brandon has just gained seven pounds. And at the time he received his first round of fetal stem cells in December of 2014, his lung capacity was only 16%. And now, his lung capacity is at 24%. While fetal stem cells can't repair the genetic mutation that causes cystic fibrosis, it is Brandon's hope that fetal stem cells will prolong his need for a double lung transplant or perhaps avoid the transplant altogether. Now, imagine this is a stem cell. Stem cells are unique because they have the ability to generate new cells of almost any kind. They all start off as unspecialized cells, but given the right chemical and genetic signals, the stem cells can divide to form slightly more specialized cells of different size, shape and function. And after a few more cycles of division, these can give rise to highly specialized cells like heart muscle cells, for example, that help your heart pump the blood around your body. Given a different set of signals, this same unspecialized stem cell can go down an alternative pathway and give rise to a different type of specialized cell, like a neuron that transmits electrical signals in the brain. Most of the public doesn't understand what stem cells are, much less understand the differences between their types. So here is a brief overview. Umbilical cord stem cells are cord or placental blood cells that are saved at birth. However, umbilical cord blood transplants have limitations, as treatment of adults with cord blood has so far proved to be very challenging. Up until recently, they are only really known to treat blood diseases. While there are a handful of clinical trials recently opened for non-blood-related diseases in children, using cord blood requires a genetic match, and there is no guarantee that your cord blood will spontaneously transform into the required specialized cells to help with your ailment. And be forewarned, if you are currently expecting a child and plan on banking your child's cord blood, it's important to realize that gaining access to your own child's cord blood cells is no easy task. We spent approximately $4,000 mm -hmm. for his cells. And when it came down to it, my disease per se happened to be autism, I could not get them. They would not release them to me, even though, I, I mean, I went all the way to the top. They advertised that they will be able to do this, 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 and this. That did not happen. I could not get them. When I finally got to the head of Viacord, when I asked, finally, how many have you released? The answer I received from the clinical director was one. I bought them, I paid for them, and I could not get them. Adult stem cells are the most popular and the least controversial. Now, researchers have found adult stem cells in more tissues than previously thought. Bone marrow, skin, brain, liver, eyes, and this has led to research into using the patient's own adult stem cells to repair damaged organs. However, there are currently several limitations to using adult stem cells. Adult stem cells are often present in only minute quantities and therefore can be difficult to isolate and purify. Adult stem cells may also contain more DNA abnormalities caused by sunlight, toxins, and errors in making more DNA copies during the course of a lifetime. There has been recent buzz about how scientists can now reprogram adult stem cells to behave like embryonic stem cells, but they are still adulterated cells and may also suffer DNA abnormalities. The use of embryonic stem cells has been a hot topic of public debate. So much so that President George W. Bush banned all federal funding for embryonic stem cell research in 2007 only to be overturned by President Barack Obama two years later. 
Embryonic stem cells are unadulterated stem cells that can be easily grown in a petri dish and harvested within the first five days of development. But they also come with limitations. The ability of embryonic stem cells to form non-cancerous tumors called teratomas is one of their defining traits. It's a frightening one, particularly for those who hope to develop therapies from these cells. What makes fetal stem cells uniquely different is because the fetus provides stem cells harvested from nearly all relevant organs. The fetus contains pure, unadulterated stem cells right out of the gate. After all, these stem cells have only nine months to create an entire human being. And harvesting them is quite easy. A woman decides that she wants an abortion and then is given the option to have her fetus discarded or donated to science. When fetal stem cells are injected, the idea is that they go into our body's nervous and immune system and hone in on areas that need repair. This basic biological phenomenon is also observed between a mother and child during pregnancy. Fetal cells migrate into the mother during pregnancy and can persist for decades. Fetal cells also appear to target sites of injury, crossing both the placental and blood-brain barriers. Fetal cells appear to change into whatever specific type of cell is needed, so fetal cells in a mother with liver damage could transform into liver cells. So, to summarize, in order for umbilical, embryonic, or adult stem cells to be effective, they must spontaneously transform into the different cell types of our body. While fetal stem cells also work the same way, they already contain the unadulterated building blocks of our nervous and immune systems. While the logical superiority of fetal stem cells makes sense when observed objectively, their research and use has sparked a political firestorm. Iran and Planned Parenthood. Killing babies in America. The 30 to $100 price, or that's per yes. specimen that we're talking per about, specimen. right? Yeah. This makes deciphering facts from fiction in the media near impossible, as special interest groups will only defend stem cell types that fit within their agenda. Look at whenever there's a news story of a great success with stem cells, it's always adult stem cells. And leaving current fetal stem cell researchers to work in the shadows out of fear for their lives. What the doctors told us in the United States is that um, Joey, his lifespan not, might not be out of his teens because of his heart and lungs. And um, you know, he'll be in a wheelchair before he's even 10. This is my son, Joey. Uh, he has muscular dystrophy limb girdle. And uh, that's, that's wasting of the muscles um, throughout the whole body, eventually. Um, mainly it starts in the shoulders and the hips. The disease was being pretty aggressive, um, so I probably couldn't get him in here fast enough, really, once I did my research. Um, since then, you know, he has maintained his heart, his lungs are full strength. How do the doctors feel about his improvement? Well, I told them what we were doing, and, uh, you know, at first they told me not to, uh, not to do it, you know, that, you know, if there's not enough research on it, there's not enough documentation on it. But after we got back from the first or even the second time, basically they said, keep doing what you're doing. Because they don't see it anyway. They see thousands of patients a month, a year. You know, I'm not sure the exact number. And there's never, they never get better. They always get worse. And it's aggressive. Most of the kids that were his age with the same disease are not mobile right now. And uh, as you can see, he stands straight. So this is something that should be should be readily available to everybody. There should be scientists working around the clock on this instead of uh, trying to make pills, you know? People, I have to tell people that I have Parkinson's. Nobody would ever believe it. So it's, 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 it's big. Uh, since the treatment, uh, I've always been active and uh, play golf. My lowest golf score was a 77. And since then I have shot even par. I don't have the shakes and tremors, so that makes a big difference in, in being able to walk 18 holes. The physical liabilities that, that incur on, on most people with Parkinson's, you just can't do that. Oh, it's remarkable. Before, 
he had trouble walking. Ever since he's come back the last time, he's like his old self. Well, I've known Steve for about, I'd say, I'd say about 10 years now, but I've been playing golf with him for a number of years too, and that's where I've uh, noticed most of his affliction. You know, you could see the similarities to, uh, who's the actor that had Parkinson? Michael Fox, I think, and uh, so he had a lot of those same things, a shakiness and, and whatnot. And then, uh, I guess it was probably two to three weeks ago. I saw Steve out here play, and he wasn't playing with our group. But I saw him. I, I saw somebody that I thought might be Steve. Everyone in the group commented, uh, "That looks like Steve." No, because he wasn't, you know, having trouble getting started walking. And I and I thought, no, that that that's not Steve because he was he was walking normally. And so, uh, sure enough, it was him. And second. Good shot. And uh, it was obvious that something had happened. And now he's uh, really walking just, just like the rest of us. It really appears to be mir miraculous. Now he's shooting, he's playing better than the rest of us. And uh, so he's, uh, he's had a dramatic improvement. I have a wonderful physical therapist. Most patients are progressive with, with the Parkinson's, but um, his spirits are high, I think, and um, he's very encouraged, I think, by the treatment, so he's working hard to, to continue to improve. I actually bowled last week, bowled a 278, which is the highest game I've ever bowled in my life. You know, you'd ask me if, if my doctor knew, and I told you I, I never told him because he had mentioned to me that if he could take me to a convention, that he would win Doctor of the Year because I was doing so good. Steve's story is somewhat unique. During this investigation, I found that not everyone with Parkinson's got better. Fetal stem cells only appeared to help those with Parkinson's who were recently diagnosed, usually within one to two years, like Steve and the case of Carolyn Porter. So my husband and I sat down at the table and I remember that night that I took my fork and I started to take a bite and my hand started trembling, trembling so bad that I couldn't stop. I took the left hand and I finally was able to take a bite. Well, for a year and a half, I had been going to my computer every single night and I would type in Parkinson's disease and stem cell popped up on my computer. And I thought, I didn't type in stem cell. What is stem cell? I had gotten to the point that I couldn't walk and I certainly couldn't talk. I went in May of 2013. When I came through the airport, everything was in a wheelchair. They told me there were no guarantees. So we, we were wide open. We knew there were no guarantees. And they said it would be up to six months probably if the stem cell helped me. Well, we finished the treatment on a Saturday and we came back to the hotel and uh, we left on a Sunday. Going home, I said to my husband, I think I can walk. He said, oh, no, no, you can't walk. She informed me on the way home that I didn't need the help, but that she could get up and walk on her own, and she did, which was very surprising. We got to the, to the airplane, and I just could tell that I was getting better. Three days after I had the stem cell treatment, I just started speaking correctly. All of a sudden, it was like everything stopped. It was like there were no more tremors, there were more, no more head shaking. It was maybe 10 days after she got back. She got out of her car and I literally, I mean, it just, I, I had cold chills because she could walk. We sat down, her hands did not move, she did not jerk. She could carry on a conversation without stuttering. And we both just sat and cried. And I promise you, everything stopped. I was well, and I was the most happiest person in the world. I played the piano all the time. Well, for two years, I couldn't play the piano. I'm just, I'm not a really good pianist. My thing when I get home from work, the first thing I do is turn the news on and watch it and 
when I'm sitting in my easy chair, but I always get interrupted by Carolyn playing the piano, which interferes with, with my television duty. Concerned the fact that she is being able to play the piano is, is a good reason that it, I don't have to have to watch the news every night. My doctor was, he just couldn't believe it. He calls me his miracle patient. So I don't need any medication anymore. At the moment, the largest stem cell research agency in the world is CIRM, or the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, a multi-billion dollar agency that was voted into existence in 2004 by the citizens of California. We are an agency that was created to help uh, patients, and our mission is to accelerate stem cell treatments to those patients with unmet medical needs. Since their inception more than a decade ago, they've faced some criticism from the media for what they perceive as a lack of progress, with the LA Times calling them a $6 billion public investment that was born in hype. But it appears the mainstream media hasn't truly investigated why CIRM's efforts are moving so slow. Welcome to the December board meeting for CIRM. This observation was further confirmed when we found ourselves to essentially be one of the only members of the media attending CIRM's 2015 Science Subcommittee board meeting in Los Angeles. CIRM's board consists of a colorful assortment of members, from doctors and scientists, retired Senator Art Torres, former CEO of Paramount Pictures, Sherry Lansing, to actress, writer, director, Lauren Miller, Seth Rogen's wife. At the time of this meeting, CIRM announced the commencement of 15 clinical trials, three of which involve fetal stem cells. While CIRM has plenty of money and influential people at the helm, they repeatedly expressed that their biggest impediment isn't science or money, but the FDA, a regulatory agency that continues to insist on applying the drug development model for a conventional drug to stem cell treatments, which is like forcing a round peg into a square hole. 70% of respondents uh, to our surveys uh, listed FDA as the single biggest impediment to developing stem cell therapies. From the time we discover a stem cell product that looks promising to the time we can actually get an IND approved by the FDA to where we can start, uh, we can start doing clinical trials. That right now for stem cell therapies is too long. It's somewhere between six to eight years. The industry average for anything that's not a stem cell is 3.2 years. And so we look at that and we say, okay, that's a problem. Cell therapies are either, either essentially unregulated uh, by FDA and very little regulation. Take you less than $100,000 to take you less than three months uh, to comply. Or they are excessively regulated by FDA. Um, where it costs greater than a billion dollars and it, it takes longer than, 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 than 12 years. And there's nothing in between. And all of the other disciplines of, of medicine have something uh, in between. In other words, to address this growing field, in 2001, the FDA created a new tiered approach paradigm to deal with the approval of stem cell therapies by allowing certain stem cell therapies they deem safe, like adult stem cells, to simply exist without regulation. While most all other stem cell technologies, including fetal stem cells, are forced to go through at least a 12-year, $1 billion regulatory process just to reach the market. We also know that stem cell therapies, from a commercial standpoint, uh, uh, clear, uh, clearly uh, are, are, are a disadvantage. So big pharma uh, companies will uh, disproportionately in license non-cell technologies at a much greater rate than, than, than cell technologies. Only 8% of CIRM's programs actually have partners. The reason there is no commercial interest is because stem cells are just biology that anyone with the proper resources can harness. They simply can't be patented or placed into the current monopoly-driven pharmaceutical paradigm. 
The very idea that an increasing number of people are discovering this technology, many of whom no longer require the pharmaceutical medications they were expected to be prescribed for the rest of their lives, is an extremely frightening reality to the current business paradigm the pharmaceutical industry has relied on for decades. And since the FDA's Drug Evaluation Department has literally been purchased by the pharmaceutical industry due to Congress passing the Drug User Fee Act, with nearly $1 billion of the FDA's annual $1.3 billion drug evaluation budget coming directly from the pharmaceutical industry it is supposed to be regulating, there is no logical reason the medical industry is going to loosen its reins on this groundbreaking technology anytime soon. In fact, the FDA recently began providing members of the U.S. Congress with one-sided information, reporting only the dangers of stem cell treatments, much of which was outdated and does not reflect what is documented in the clinical literature. These actions cast the FDA in a very unfavorable light and seem to make it appear that they are actively lobbying against a therapeutic modality for which they are responsible for fostering. We're not anti-regulation, we're not anti-FDA, um, but we, we also will not ignore that there's a problem. We reject outright the notion that a regulatory pathway that takes over 15 years and costs over $2 billion is the only way to go. That's not, that's not an acceptable approach. The demand, the need is very real. Patients really are suffering. They really are desperate. They really do need help. The entities, the researchers, and the companies that have the solutions view, in, in some respects, the barriers between uh, their, their current therapies and those patients as insurmountable. Then lastly, with respect to centers uh, that operate um, uh, either overseas or underneath the jurisdiction of, of, of FDA, that is a symptom of the problem. Uh, they take their products and their technologies overseas where they're not, uh, they're not uh, subject to the same regulatory constraints. The common denominator is we're not doing anything that's meaningfully advancing the field and helping the patients. Due to this reality, people like Lawrence Simon, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis a few years ago, aren't going to just sit around waiting for any well-meaning agency to catch up and alter a regulatory system that doesn't want to change. Have you spoken to your doctor about what you're doing? I have. There's no tremor, which there was initially. How about your grasp? Squeeze. Good. Very good strike there. Very good. Ordinarily, in your experience, if you don't mind me asking, Go ahead. Um, considering how many years ago he's been diagnosed, 2011, like what do you usually see? Some people will just go on down the trail and become worse and worse and worse and become better, which I have seen. And they'll fail every therapy. He's basically reached, I would say, a plateau and stabilized where he's no longer declining. I'm very impressed with what I'm looking at, I gotta tell you. And I've been at it 50 years almost, that ought to taste him. And he's been my patient for about 30. So what do we say about all this? I don't know, except to say that there's something that works here. I don't think it's anything we're giving him, I really don't. From what I've seen and the failures I've seen, I'm pleased. <laughs> what else can I tell you? No, that's all I wanted to hear is just you be honest. And tell no, me, I'll yeah. tell you the truth. If I thought it was crap, I'd tell you that too. I'm the first one. Ask him. I see a lot of stuff that's bogus. I was not, in the beginning, enthusiastic about all this. I said, well, if you got the money to waste, go ahead. But then again, you're talking about a disease you can't cure So, with what we have, so why not? And I'm, you know, proof of the pudding. I haven't seen anybody get this well. Now, you'd think I was a salesman for the thing. But, <laughs> but you know what? Salesman, no salesman. I'm glad to see him better. Whatever it takes. And you wouldn't let him walk without assistance. So look where we are today. The MRI was diagnostic. He had lesions uh, all over the place. In January 2011, 
After experiencing weakness and vertigo, Lawrence's neurologist ordered an MRI, which would find many areas of abnormality favoring active disease. Numerous lesions and plaques were found, representing active multiple sclerosis. A few weeks after this appointment, on March 25th, Lawrence had another MRI, which found no new areas of abnormality and no abnormal lesions. Susie became a patient 31 years ago. She was frequently ill with recurring respiratory illnesses, intermittent swelling of lymph glands, frequently treated with antibiotics. In 2004, she became more severely ill and more persistently presented with lymph glands that were swollen all over her body. In consideration of the fact that she has a family history of a lymphocytic malignancy, it was appropriate to further investigate why her lymph glands were remaining swollen and weren't getting better after treatment for infectious causes. This was the bone marrow biopsy. It confirmed she had a condition called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Most people with the condition do have progressive illness and that it can convert to a serious life-threatening malignancy. It was interesting as we have followed her in the past 10 years that there has been no progression of her lymphocytic leukemia. And in fact, there's been improvement in the number of abnormal cells relative to normal cells in her blood. Her lymph glands have remained normal. They responded very quickly to treatments that she received at the time. You've got probably the most carefully documented body in my practice in terms of, you know, six to eight inches of paper charts before the new computerized records started in 2006, which if we were to print them out would likely occupy several boxes of computer paper. I'm sure. And I'm sure. we've been testing your laboratories frequently and I do have to acknowledge that we're not finding anything wrong with you or evidence of any side effects from the treatments that you've received. What's important is that it is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and that it hasn't progressed and that you're not sick. The majority of people don't have that experience. So that a doctor seeing somebody with CLL initially figures we'll be okay for a few years and then we're gonna have trouble. You're talking about 2004, so you're talking about 11 years ago that right. you had this diagnosis, right? Yes. Correct. And based on the fact that my father started out okay with chronic and ended up with acute, I wasn't going to do that. Understandably, Susie's doctor was quite nervous to talk to us on camera, hence his modesty. Not only did Susie's chronic lymphocytic leukemia not progress to acute, Pathologists were baffled at the unusual finding that her cells normalized, which means her diagnosis was reversed or cured. In order to have a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it requires an absolute B cell count of over 5,000. Susie's absolute B cell count reduced to 304. Susie underwent no other medical intervention for her diagnosis other than receiving a series of fetal stem cell injections. Part of my discomfort being part of this project, I'm making myself a target. To... But realistically, stem cell therapy is becoming more mainstream. It is important that people know about it and that we learn more about it. My preference would be that it was done in a scientific way that we can all learn from our experiences, and if we don't have explorers, we never learn anything. It's a chance, right? I mean, it's a shot. It's people... working well for, well, something is working well for you. Something is working well for me, and I'm not doing anything else, so. We're Thank good. You. Yes, we are. We are good. Thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome. When she decided to have the stem cells, initially, as a, a MD, somewhat skeptical, I became more and more convinced of the benefit as the years went on that she just got better and better. Uh, and very honestly, when you go to medical school, I think they put a pair of horse blinders on you. And that unless it's taught in medical school or you read it in 
the medical literature, it can't be, can't be valid, can't happen. Susie is a living proof. She's healthier than I am, considering I have some conditions my own that I think could possibly be benefit. I'm actually considering having uh, the stem cells myself. I've been through about 14 doctors. I mean, she was going to extremes to try and just lift the pain off just a little bit. She even cut her hair off because she figured that that would help her neck. When I look back and I think about all the doctor visits, I remember being in the office with Danny and whatever physician we were with at that time, and then saying, well, it's in her head or something to that nature. I could see her eyes fill up with tears, and I would just put my hands on her face, and I would say to her, I am not gonna stop. You will not suffer one more day if I have anything to do about it. I got my wisdom teeth taken out, and I got prescribed the medication that she got prescribed for just if she had a really bad day. You know, here, take some narcotics, you know. In late 2013, a genetic test finally helped doctors diagnose Danny with ankylosing spondylitis. This is a type of inflammatory arthritis that primarily affects the spine, causing the ligaments to become inflamed. The cartilage then fuses to the vertebrae, causing the spine to fuse, causing immobility. After all, medical treatments failed to help Danny. From a host of anti-inflammatories to methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug usually given to cancer patients, as well as tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, and some of the most powerful narcotics available, she then underwent fetal stem cell therapy in Mexico on July 25th, 2014. She had this smile from ear to ear. I hadn't seen that smile in so long. The minivan brought her back to our hotel. She says, Mom, let's go for a walk. Let's go shopping and go out to eat. And I was like, what? Who are you? Within a week of getting the stem cells, I stopped taking all of my medicines. They weren't allowing me to be me. Uh, they changed my personality so much. And that's something that stem cells has given me. It's given me the ability to be me because I don't have to poison my body with all the other medicines that change who I am. Danny is now a Division I athlete whose rowing team reached the NCAA championships. Rowing is probably one of the most physically demanding sports you can do. It works every single muscle in your body. I had no clue with even all of my hours of research that this type of therapy was even available. Most people find out about fetal stem cell therapy by word of mouth. Danny's mother discovered it by looking for a used truck for her son. If it wasn't for me, meeting Jan Good over finding that perfect truck for my son. I don't know what we would have done. And I said, wow, I can't believe that you're here. I can't believe God sent you here. He didn't send you here for this truck. He sent you here to hear this. Meet Jan Good and her 16-year-old adopted daughter, Mariah. Two years ago, when Mariah was 14 years old, she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, as well as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, as well as systemic lupus erythematosus. I first met Mariah about three years ago in April 2012. She and her mom had just moved down from Tennessee, and she came in for an office visit. Um, she had been diagnosed with um, lupus in Tennessee, However, shortly after moving to Florida, she started having problems with um, joint pain, knee pain, back pain, and it really limited her ability to do the things that she enjoyed doing, like playing basketball. 
And so at that point, we considered having her see a rheumatologist. And the rheumatologist's concern was, again, lupus, along with her having um, juvenile arthritis. And so as part of the treatment regimen at that point, um, she was placed on a, a couple chemotherapy agents. So the rheumatologist put Mariah on methotrexate, which is a chemo drug, and prednisone. And it kept increasing the dosage. She could not get out of bed. She could barely make it to the bathroom, barely make it to eat. By April of 2013, lab reports found blood in Mariah's urine, signaling the beginning of kidney failure. So that's when I drew the line and just said, no more, no more chemo, no more of the steroids. I was desperate. I took a white sheet and wrote on there, hope for Mariah, give Mariah life, something about stem cell treatment, and literally hung it in her front yard. And uh, people started donating furniture and different things, and we had garage sales, and people would just randomly knock on our door and hand us $20 or $100 for her stem cell treatment. And then I ended up putting a sheet in the back on the, on the um, fence. The city had a fit. They made me take both of them down. They, did, it was, they didn't like it. And I guess it was because it was more old-fashioned country, redneck way of dealing with the problem. But it worked, you know? It got us where we need to be. And we put her in a wheelchair and got her on the plane and we were all nervous because we'd never been to Mexico. What's this going to be like? And your mind's like, well, is this really real? And is this going to work? And you're all emotional. And, and they gave my baby life. On the ride back to San Diego, I remember her saying, I feel hyper. I feel hyper. And she got really giggly. And so we went back to the motel that we were staying at and she ate and I went to do laundry. Beside the laundry room was a exercise room. And she said, Mom, can I go over here and get on this and see how, what happens? I go, yes, but take it very, very slow because your muscles you know, haven't been working in a year and a half. And then she come back and she goes, come here, I want to show you something. And, and I mean, I sit there and I'm watching her and saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Mom, I'm having fun. But three hours after the stem cell treatment, she done two miles on the elliptical and then jumped on the treadmill and done two more miles. She seems to be doing quite well. Do you have any comments at all about the, what they tried? The um, don't have a whole lot of background in terms of the, the uses of uh, the, the therapy. However, it, if it seems to be, it seems to have made a difference in her life, I guess it's something that can sit in game. It, you know, it's something that um, was a benefit to her. Just when we thought this story couldn't possibly get more interesting, Janet Good had also been dealing with her own health issues. Incredibly, one year after Mariah's recovery, her adopted mother Janet was diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus as well as dermatomyositis. I never dreamed that a year later that I would be given a death sentence of three months to two years and I would need stem cells. So finding the stem cells from Mariah and it saving her life, in turn, I needed them and it saved my life. You gotta pass it on. You gotta tell everybody what you've been through and how it's helped you because it can save their life too or maybe one of their family members' life. In a tragic turn of events, on November 6, 2016, Mariah was shot and killed. Now, now the life that was stayed with the stem cells, now that life's been snuffed out and taken away by somebody with anger issues. Not only do people seek fetal stem cells for various immunological and neurological ailments, some of the world's busiest professionals are seeking fetal stem cells for anti-aging, better performance, and overall longevity. This is George Schlaughter, a multi-Emmy award-winning American comedy television icon. He's best known for his work as a founding producer and writer for the groundbreaking television comedy classic, Rowan and Martin's laughing. It's a powerful, powerful tool for good, for good health. I took the injection myself. And when I came home, my wife looked at me. She said, well, what, what happened to you? Where, where have you been, right? It wasn't a high. It wasn't like any kind of drug or anything. It was just a sense of, of well-being. It wasn't even euphoria. It was just a sense of being comfortable. So I took the injection, and I then took some people down there, including my wife and including my daughter. And I cannot understand the resistance to it, except for the fact that 
if stem cells, fetal stem cells, ever become widely used, it will change the entire profit picture of the pharmaceutical industry because they don't make their money on well people. They make their money on sick people and uh, continually pumping drugs of all kinds into them. That is how the medical profession survives, on drugs. Medical profession is great. They do great things. I wouldn't want to have a plumber deliver a baby, but they resist this out of the opinion that this will change the whole profit structure of the medical profession, and it will. It's coming. It's just a question of when. They resisted Jonas Salk, and having had polio, I wish they'd stopped resisting before I got it. My, my favorite is they said, there hasn't been a double-blind study. There's been double-blind studies on a lot of the drugs that killed people. There's been double-blind studies on uh, chemotherapy, which we know a lot of people have not survived. It's just that it kind of makes me very, very uncomfortable to think that waiting for some kind of a double-blind study that would result in the death of one child and the cure of another. My question always is, how do you select which child to treat with a placebo and which child to treat with the stem cells? Use of fetal stem cells is anywhere near as dangerous as cough medicine. It can kill you. This is William Rader, the chief scientific officer for Stem Cell of America, a company operating out of Southern California. Most of the patients you've seen so far were treated by Rader's company. However, due to strict American federal regulations, these patients had to travel to Tijuana, Mexico to obtain the injections. Earlier in my career, I was one of the first medical experts on television. Starting out first in radio, then eventually appearing multiple times on The Merv Griffin Show. Dr. William Rader. Doctor. His successful television career continued well into the 1990s. I received a phone call from Eastern Europe, and they called me and told me about fetal stem cells. So I said to him, I'll tell you what. I want to see this. I want to interview you. I want to interview patients. I want to just do whatever I want to do when I'm there. Would you agree to that? They said yes. Ten days later, I'm on an air Ukraine plane. It totally blew my mind what I saw. In 1995, William Rader traveled to Kyiv, Ukraine, and spent some time with the founders of a medical university clinic called MCEL. This is the late Professor Alexander Smigadup, who, in 1991, is the man responsible for originally inventing and developing the technological innovation of fetal stem cell therapy, along with M-Cell's co-founder and partner, Dr. Alexei Karpenko, who you will meet later. Professor Smigadub and Professor Karpenko taught William Rader the basic techniques of fetal stem cell transplantation. According to Professor Alexei Karpenko, M-Cell was also looking to partner with William Rader on a new clinic, but Rader decided to take the information he learned and open up his own fetal stem cell company instead. I dropped everything else and I dedicated myself to fetal stem cell research. During production on this documentary, the California Medical Board revoked William Rader's medical license in their failed attempt to stop his operation. Nonetheless, I decided to get the cells in March of 2015, and I was treated no different than any of the other patients. Stem Cell of America doesn't perform any preliminary medical testing, and this entire injection process takes about 30 minutes. As with anything that is done while avoiding federal regulations, obtaining full transparency as a journalist telling this part of the story was difficult, as I wasn't allowed access to any of Rader's research laboratories where Rader claims to replicate their fetal stem cells instead of using new and fresh aborted cells. So to truly get to the bottom of this convoluted story, I traveled to M-Cell in Kyiv, Ukraine, where this technology got its start more than 20 years ago. And what better way to fully understand fetal stem cell therapy than to experience it by the world's original pioneers. While undergoing M-Cell's three-day longevity anti-aging program, M-Cell allowed me to document my entire treatment program and film their laboratories and facilities. Unlike most medical clinics in the United States, M-Cell tested my blood and urine in their lab on site. 
It is from these lab results, in addition to a full ultrasound and electrocardiogram, that M-Cell's doctors designed a special protocol just for me, which consisted of a variety of fetal stem cell types, a three-day facial using fetal stem cells, hyperbaric oxygen sessions, and even massage to help keep my circulatory system flowing nicely to allow the stem cell transplants to properly take hold. So on day one, after all my preliminary testing was complete, I was moved to a private room where I enjoyed some coffee and an all organic breakfast I ordered from the menu while I waited for my primary physician to arrive. This is Dr. Irina who is both a medical doctor and a PhD working regularly behind the scenes in expanding M-Cell's research and development of fetal stem cell technology. This is Lena, one of M-Cell's managers and the translator assigned to me. At the start of each day, Dr. Irina checked all my vital signs and asked me various questions related to my overall health. After my physical exam, Dr. Irina carefully explained my entire fetal stem cell treatment program, which was an incredibly complex array of a variety of fetal stem cell types that were harvested between seven to 12 weeks of gestation and scheduled across a three-day period to seek a variety of goals to improve my overall health. The combination of fetal stem cells given to me on day one helps to create new capillaries and other small vessels across all of my organs, which help to deliver more oxygen and nutrition throughout my body, thus improving overall functions in my organ tissues. These cells also have very positive effects on the inner wall of big blood vessels, therefore protecting my vessels from atherosclerosis. And if there is any current atherosclerosis, it prevents it from progressing. They have a very positive effect on the liver, blood formation, bone marrow, immune, and hormonal systems, essentially giving my entire immune system a full reboot. They started first with a standard sodium chloride saline drip to open up my veins, followed by some anti-allergy meds just to be on the safe side. And after all of this settled in, they brought in my first round of fetal stem cells. Then it was off to see their masseuse, Yuri. The massage was about an hour back to my room for a little lunch and relaxation, followed by hyperbaric oxygen. I had never been in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber before. It feels sort of like flying in an airplane, only with perfect high density oxygenated air quality. Are you? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Hyperbaric oxygen sessions are healthy anyway, but in this case, it serves as further nutrition for the fetal stem cells. And then I was off to the cosmetologist for the first day of my facial. My cosmetologist was Helena, who first gave my face a thorough cleaning before applying the key ingredient of this cosmetic therapy, chorion cells, which Helena had already prepared shortly before my facial began. Chorion cells are early fetal membrane cells that are rich in high density nutrition, vitamins, and minerals. These cells are highly anti-inflammatory and regenerative when applied to the skin. And M-Cell is the only place in the world offering chorion cells as part of a cosmetic facial. The chorion cells were then carefully brushed onto my face. Helena then applied a rejuvenation mask containing aloe vera and other ingredients to end the session. And this was the end of my first day of treatment. And they also provided transportation to and from the clinic each day. At the end of day one, I really wanted to do some sightseeing in the beautiful city of Kiev, but M-Cell's doctors requested that I take it easy and not exert myself too much. I stayed downtown near the central square of Kiev which provided a plethora of hotels, shopping, and food. Day two. Dr. Irina checked my vitals, and I was given a second round of the same fetal stem cells I received on day one. Off to massage. 
And then round two of hyperbaric oxygen. This is Dr. Maria, who was supervising my sessions. Not only is Dr. Maria a medical doctor, she received her PhD in fetal stem cell therapy. Back to my room, where Dr. Irina inspected my abdomen to prepare me for my first subcutaneous injections of the cells that will improve my neuronal or nervous system. These cells improve all processes regulated by my nervous system, improving all interneuronal connections, improving motor skills, as well as my autonomic nervous system, like heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, and pupillary response, while also improving memory, concentration, sleep, and overall cognition, essentially giving my entire nervous system a healthy reboot. After a standard saline drip was completed, this combination of cells were injected subcutaneously into the fat of my abdomen. The reason for the location of these injections is because the fat of our bodies hold the most stable temperature and allow overall protection of these cells as they adjust to my body and begin to slowly release into my nervous system. And finally, day two of my facial. Helena started first by placing steam on my face to open up the pores, followed by applying more Corion cells. After allowing the Corion concentration to be absorbed by my skin, Helena prepared an alginate mask at a very cold temperature to then close my pores, sealing the Corion cells inside and further stimulating micro blood circulation. And that was it for day two. Wow. Well, at least at MCEL, as I decided it was time to do a little sightseeing. The city of Kyiv is gorgeous and rich with history and culture. During my journey, I met an American from Pennsylvania who is in love with Kyiv as much as me. Now 12 weeks here over the last year, and this is one of the most wonderful city I've ever been in. Mr. DeMarco is also an M cell patient. 18 years ago, I had a very bad motorcycle accident, and along with many other injuries, I suffered a uh, broken vertebrae, uh, spinal cord damage, and my brachial plexus nerve group was evolved or torn out on my right side. Those nerves control my right lung, my scapula, right arm. After multiple reconstructive surgeries, I was left with severe spinal cord nerve damage pain. I was prescribed morphine, mexiltine, neurotin, um, many different narcotics. Uh, unfortunately, none of them worked. They would somewhat lessen the pain for short periods of time, but nothing would stop it. I became addicted to the morphine after two years. Uh, I was taking over 200 milligrams of morphine a day. Let me describe the pain. The pain, there was two types of pain. It was a 24-7 type of compression, squeezing pain, which was more bearable than the shooting pains that I experienced. Uh, the shooting pains I could liken to uh, a knitting needle that was heated over a flame and plugged into a wall and then stuck in your funny bone. And they would stick it in there for about 30 seconds and pull it out. And then stick it in there for 30 seconds and then pull it out. Uh, jump ahead to a year and a half ago, I was here in Kiev on some personal business and found out about uh, the stem cell clinic M-Cell. There were no promises given to me, uh, just that in the past it had helped people in my situation. I was advised to wait uh, two or three months before I started tapering off the medication that I was on that was lessening the frequency of the episodes. And I have not had one pain episode since the end of December first time in 18 years. I am totally pain-free and medication-free. Dr. Irina checked my vitals as usual. And then time for my second round of subcutaneous injections. But this round of subcutaneous injections was an array of fetal stem cells to help me with my entire musculoskeletal system, which helps to improve my bones, cartilage, 
tendons, ligaments, and my joints and all their connective tissues, improving overall metabolic processes, while also increasing trophic and elasticity of my skin. Also increasing energy levels, triggering regeneration, rejuvenation, and overall high efficiency. Which also, by the way, includes a great improvement of sexual functions. Essentially, giving my entire metabolic system a nice reboot. The reasons for the location of these injections is the same for the cells I received on day two. My third massage. And then back to my room, where they gave me an IV drip of amino acids to further improve my body's environment, giving the fetal stem cells the best chance of doing their job. And finally, it was back to my room, where Dr. Irina spent a great deal of time summarizing my entire treatment program, reviewing my blood, urine, and other tests they performed, and explaining to me why they gave me the types of injections and therapy they did. Each patient undergoing therapy at MCIL has a completely different personalized therapeutic schedule depending on their current health or any more serious ailments they may have. Since I'm pretty healthy already, I underwent MCIL's longevity anti-aging program, but others with specific ailments would receive a different protocol. I met the Kalahar family who had just arrived from Houston, Texas, whose youngest son Beckham underwent MCIL's personalized treatment protocol for autism. This is Beckham's father, Matt, and his mother, Terry. While there on day three, I had the privilege to meet Dr. Alexei Karpenko, the original co-founder and partner at MSO. Um, yes, uh, you see, with autism, uh, with autism, we have uh, rather positive results. But the only thing that uh, I should warn you, this will not be, most probably, complete recovery. Uh, most of his function will benefit, but full recovery uh, we have not observed. We understand. We understand. We, we, we're seeking quality of life improvement. Yes. Okay. I wish you success. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Considering that autism currently strikes one in every 45 children in the United States, costing each family supporting a child with autism over the course of his or her lifetime as much as $2.4 million to care for such a diagnosis, I was quite interested in seeing how Beckham fared after fetal stem cell treatment. So, four months later, I traveled to the Kelahar's hometown of Houston, Texas to see if Beckham had made any progress. We had a lot of aggression. Beckham would scratch me, he would bite me. Mm -hmm. So I would go to bed nightly and I would have bloody sheets. I would have scratch marks. They would be on my face, my back, wherever. I'm talking full on biting, full on scratching, full on bruising, all gone. We had no eye contact. I would try to get in his face, Beckham, Beckham, Beckham. In his world. He would just look straight past me. He'd look straight past you. It was, it, it was, it was, it was really, really, really difficult. But yeah. the eye contact was absolutely not there, period. It, it was even more than that. When you looked in his eyes, it was almost as if you were looking in his eyes and you, were, you weren't seeing any. Nobody was home. He wouldn't respond to his name. He wouldn't respond to anything. And it was pretty drastic when that happened. Almost immediately after he had his stem cell transplant, we saw changes. He had this terrible eczema everywhere, all over his skin. Within three days, it was gone. I have fought that eczema for years with prednisone, you name it. I've tried dietary changes. Mm -hmm. It was gone. His skin was clear. His eyes turned bright. All of a sudden, these smiles I had not seen in years. We started swimming. He could not swim before. He gets his head underwater. He loves it. Before his stem cell transplant, he would not walk for me. I always had to carry him. He would just block my body and refuse to walk. I couldn't walk him around the block at three. I had to have a stroller. All of a sudden, he's walking. He walks now, holds my hand like a neurotypical child, and we walk. We can walk in the park. I can walk with him to the grocery store, to the mall. Um, that might not seem like a big deal mm -hmm. to parents that are used to it, but for those that aren't able to have a child walk, it's a huge deal. So the fact that I could do that 
made my life so much easier. So I'm not holding a 45 pound kid, 18 bags of groceries. I mean, it, it, that's, it's really miserable and difficult. So um, that was another huge thing. He's just so much more receptive to a different idea, which was not the case before. Go up. Oh, oh. there you are. He can now motor plan if he has an idea that was not there before. His cognitive levels have increased significantly. That's not Ow. That's good. Ow. Go fast. Ow. Fast. Oh, go spin fast. I've definitely seen him become more flexible because he would want to do things only the way he wanted to do it and we couldn't get um, any um, change or new ideas and new ideas was really hard for us since then. He's giving me a lot more new ideas. He's doing much better with some language. And he's also started to motor plan things. So the other day, Terry was here. He saw this and the ramp was on the other side of the room. And he went to try and get the ramp. He's never, ever had a plan about how he was going to do a task. So that was very novel and very new for him. So we've definitely seen progress in lots of di different areas. <laughs> I've been working with him since he was 18 months old, so it's almost three years now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's also giving him the feeling of where his body is in space. So how do I learn to plan and to figure out how to do things by having a really good internal body awareness? Yeah. There you are, ready? Yeah. So every day it's something new where we're both shocked. Since the Kelahar family was making the trek to M-Cell for Beckham's autism, they decided to see if fetal stem cells would also benefit their oldest son, Matt Jr. My older son has um, convergence insufficiency and ADHD. I never thought he would make it into college. I was very skeptical, very skeptical. It's helped me tremendously with just one treatment. Uh, in terms of school, I've I've gone from middle school, I've had and then high school as well. Almost flunking, staying up till two in the morning with my parents just so they could help me because I couldn't even do it myself. Till now, I'm making straight A's and B's, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, and then I'm looking in for the the future semesters to take on a larger workload because it seems more doable, more possible. So you're saying in the four month time that you're making better grades than you ever have? Yeah. Actually, beneficial, yeah, absolutely. Without taking medication now, at least winging off the dosage, I would go from pills like Vyvanse, ADHD, um, Adderall. In these past four months, it's been tremendously helpful. One of the most important things he ever said to me was, Mom, thank you so much. Thank God I don't feel dumb anymore. While Matt Jr. received fetal stem cells in hopes of finding relief for his ADHD, he was also suffering from an overactive bladder and chronic skin conditions. Uh, always having these urge, I guess, urinate every 15 to 20 minutes throughout the day entirely uh, to about two months after. I haven't had the urge at all. Uh, between my skin, I've had acne, I've had uncontrollable, it was bacterial acne. Uh, I've tried the strongest things up to Accutane, as high as you could go on it, like the dosage. It would mess up my liver, it would make me feel terrible. Uh, but honestly, in the past two months, I've had skin, my skin's cleared up on my shoulders, my back, uh, mostly around my entire face. It's a tremendous difference, as well as all the eczema around the eyes mainly, and then the arms. I've had blotches around the arms, uh, where now it's completely gone, and it's just phenomenal, it's crazy. And it's only been one treatment. So we realized there was nothing that mainstream medicine had. We'd been to absolutely every doctor we possibly could. I feel like we made the right choice. We did. There's no did. doubt in my mind. We, we had a lot of information to, to sift through and like everybody else in, in seeking information and trying to be well informed, it took us literally eight months just to weed through what we thought would be the best option for us. I cannot say how thrilled I am with the results. It's one thing to have everyone around Beckham notice such great improvements after getting fetal stem cell therapy just four months prior. And it's another to review the results of his autism spectrum test, or ADOS2. We obtained these test results from Beckham's neurologist. 
Beckham's last ADOS 2 test was in December of 2013, where he scored a 22, which fell into the moderate to severe range on the autism spectrum. However, while I was visiting the Kelahars in November of 2016, another ADOS 2 test was performed, which revealed a score of 15, a 7-point reduction, showing Beckham now in the moderate autism spectrum. These results occurred after only one round of fetal stem cell therapy. Beckham has not been taking any medications during this time. I'm so excited. I can't even, it's, it's so exciting. For the it's, first time, I see the light in the end of the tunnel. I see a light. I haven't seen a light in a long time. Back in Kyiv, after my three-day treatment was complete, I spent a couple of days with Dr. Karpenko as he told me the entire story of how M-Cell came to be while showing me around Kyiv. Dr. Karpenko had worked directly in cooperation with Ukraine's Ministry of Health, allowing M-Cell to freely and legally come into existence. It was since 1991 uh, that such technology for clinical use was made and we use it uh, about 25 years, this year, 25 years already. And it is stable, we can predict what is going on, uh, pre predict the timing of results, um, understand how it will behave, our treatment will behave in different kinds of diseases, in different ages, in different conditions of the patients. So uh, this was the start of clinical use of fetal stem cell transplantation, not just a discovery of fetal stem cells or the first pioneer um, transplantation. I took a tour of M-Cell's research facilities and quality control labs. I wanted to get a fully comprehensive understanding of how these cells are harvested and tested before being administered to patients. The process begins specifically between 7 and 12 weeks of gestation, where the fetal material from a legal, voluntary abortion with the donor's consent arrives at M-Cell within two hours of the abortion procedure. This fetal material then enters M-Cell's biotechnology laboratory. This is Christina, M-Cell's CEO and overall supervisor for all of M-Cell's harvesting and quality control laboratories. Not everybody can come inside. I know. I feel very, very privileged. I would love you to see the process of the extraction of the fetal stem cells, but I'm very sorry, but we cannot film it. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. So let's go. Yep. After M-Cell scientists extract more than a dozen different relevant categories of fetal material in their biotechnology laboratory, the fetal stem cells are immediately sent to the cryopreservation department, where they are then suspended using a special proprietary method. Once the cells are successfully suspended, they are then simultaneously sent to three different departments. During the research phase, the cells are tested for their functional activity, viability, and consistency. They need to make sure they are using healthy and thriving cells capable of expanding and replicating once injected into the body. This viability testing process also involves a state-of-the-art laser-based flow cytometer, which is capable of analyzing, counting, and sorting the fetal stem cells in real time up to a thousand particles per second. While that is happening, this exact same batch of fetal stem cells is also being tested in M-Cell's microbiology lab, where each batch of fetal stem cells is tested to make sure they do not contain any harmful bacteria or contamination. This same batch of fetal stem cells is also sent to the polymerase chain reaction laboratory, where M-Cell scientists carefully test each batch of fetal stem cells for any harmful viruses. Polymerase chain reaction is the method of molecular diagnostics that allows M-Cell scientists to identify a single copy of the DNA and RNA of harmful pathogens. 
M-Cell's testing process is repeated three times to make absolutely certain that their fetal stem cells are up to the highest standards of viability and safety before being administered to patients. M-Cell has the largest fetal stem cell bank in the world. Quite often, people confuse fetal stem cells with embryonic stem cells when they aren't remotely the same thing. An embryonic stem cell is harvested within the first five days of development in a petri dish after artificial fertilization. Unlike fetal stem cells, embryonic stem cells haven't formed any organs or valuable tissue to take advantage of, regardless of the misleading hype in the news media. Not to mention that embryonic stem cells can be quite dangerous. The ability of embryonic stem cells to form non-cancerous tumors called teratomas is one of their defining traits. It's a frightening one, particularly for those who hope to develop therapies from these cells. In many cultures, including the Ukrainian culture, the vocabulary word for fetal simply doesn't exist, which only adds to the confusion as in some cultures, the terms fetal and embryonic are used interchangeably, hence the name M-cell. I had the opportunity to read a draft manuscript of Dr. Karpenko's soon-to-be-published paper summarizing the last 25 years of fetal stem cell transplantation. In it, he mentions the first patient they ever treated, a young 14-year-old boy with severe aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia occurs when the body's immune system turns on itself and attacks the blood's platelets and the red and white blood cells, otherwise known as bone marrow failure. The only potential cure mainstream medicine offers for this disease is a life-threatening bone marrow transplant. And the only way to stay alive waiting for a bone marrow transplant is to undergo constant blood transfusions. This disease afflicts up to 900 people per year in the United States. So we decided to track this patient down 25 years later, who is now a thriving husband and father living in Switzerland. We had a lovely Skype call with Dimitro from his home in Switzerland and his parents who still live in the Ukraine. Dimitro was cured of a plastic anemia 25 years ago after only two fetal stem cell transplants. Dimitro did not undergo any other therapies other than fetal stem cell transplants, completely restoring his entire bone marrow ever since. The fact that fetal stem cells have only nine months to create an entire human being should help illustrate the power of these cells in comparison to any other stem cell type. When they enter your body, they are programmed to seek out anything that needs repair, redefining the meaning of the power of Mother Nature. For the record, I couldn't find anyone to agree to go on camera that opposed fetal stem cell therapy. I reached out to countless anti-abortion politicians, including Mrs. Blackburn from Tennessee, who chaired an anti-fetal stem cell congressional hearing in 2016. Sell human fetal tissue for a profit, you break the law. Donate fetal tissue with zero profit, you are within the law. I also reached out to anti-abortion activist and Christian evangelist Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, who also refused to participate. My contact with various stem cell experts had similar responses. When I contacted James Thompson, Time Magazine's Man Who Brought You Stem Cells, for his participation in this documentary as a stem cell expert, his response was simply, I'm sorry, but it is out of my area of expertise. Gaining legal access to fetal stem cell therapy in the United States is currently next to impossible. CIRM is running a handful of clinical trials, but these trials are currently 12 years and at least a billion dollars away from meeting FDA's requirements for market approval. And that's just for one ailment. It could theoretically take hundreds of years and billions of dollars to obtain approval for all relevant ailments. The problem we have is we don't have, after 15 years of this regulatory paradigm in place, we don't have anything close to being reviewed by the FDA for approval. 
But I think when CERN steps back and looks at that regulatory framework, we think, well, if there were something in the middle that, weren't, that wasn't as daunting as the current regulatory approach, instead of taking these innovative cell therapies overseas or having them be under the surveillance of FDA, would they just not come into the fold uh, and, and, and do the work necessary to show they're safe and effective in a timely fashion and in a way which, uh, which from a, a cost standpoint, enabled them to be successful? There are only a handful of places in the world one can obtain fetal stem cells. Another company is Stemedica, based in San Diego, who first made headlines in 2015 after treating hockey legend Gordie Howe in Tijuana, Mexico. Gordie Howe, one of the greatest hockey players of all time, was on his deathbed last year after suffering a stroke. His son, Dr. Murray Howe, had actually started writing his father's eulogy when he received a phone call from Stemedica, a San Diego-based stem cell company. Gordie Howe's stroke had left him unable to walk, but within eight hours of his first stem cell treatment, he sat up in his bed at the clinic. But he said, well, I'll just walk to the bathroom. I said, well, you can't walk. He said, well, the hell I can't. <laughs> and uh, he sits up and he puts his feet over the edge of the bed, and I was absolutely astounded that he could do that. When Gordy Howe's story first broke in 2015, we reached out to CTV, the Canadian news organization that first covered the story. They told us that Gordy received neural stem cells from a sample of fetal tissue from a 12-week-old fetus and bone marrow immune cells from a healthy 21-year-old donor from a U.S. tissue bank. Once the American media got a hold of this story, Stemetica began getting some negative publicity for using fetal stem cells. Stemetica then suddenly began claiming that the fetal brain tissue they were using was not from a 12-week-old fetus, but a 14 to 16-week-old fetus instead, claiming that they're really considered legally adult stem cells even if they're fetal derived. To make matters more confusing, if the bone marrow immune cells Stemetica is using are from a 21-year-old donor and is being injected into patients like Gordie Howe without genetically matching these patients, why do we have so many bone marrow registries around the world if they are successfully giving mature 21-year-old bone marrow cells to patients without matching them genetically? Stemetica failed to respond to any of our questions or requests to participate in this documentary. Gordy Howe passed away at 88 from what his family says was simply old age. It's important to realize that just how not all stem cell types are created equal, the same is true for the various fetal stem cell companies. In the case of Stem Cell of America and Stemetica, they both claim to use replicated cells as opposed to using fresh aborted cells, most likely due to the increasing difficulty in obtaining fresh fetal cells in the United States. Of the handful of the American fetal stem cell experts that agreed to speak to me privately and not on camera, most said that replicating the cells wasn't a good idea, as the cells could not only lose efficacy, but they also run the risk of maturing beyond their productive role. Also, Stemetica only uses neuronal cells from a single fetal brain and bone marrow cells from a single adult donor. Stem Cell of America claims to use only neuronal fetal brain cells and fetal liver cells, the liver cells that will eventually become the body's bone marrow. This isn't to say this method hasn't made many patients happy, but when you look at M-Cell, the world's pioneers of this innovation, due to M-Cell's ability to operate openly and legally in full cooperation with the Ukraine Ministry of Health, M-Cell harvests and injects each patient with more than a dozen fetal stem cell types, widening the cell's ability to help the patient beyond what only brain, liver, or bone marrow tissue can offer. And M-Cell does not believe that replicating their cells is a good idea. While Stemetica has begun to publish some of their data, Stem Cell of America has yet to author any of their own peer-reviewed publications. While M-Cell has been continuously publishing their peer-reviewed data for more than 25 years. Uh, in cases of diabetes, for example, uh, the child who has initial phase of diabetes 1 is sentenced to very low quality of life, to uh, debilitating complications, 
uh, in many cases this will uh, end with uh, kidney transplantation, with blindness, with amputations of uh, extreme uh, of legs, of foot, um, and so on. But in case of our inter uh, intervention uh, in the very beginning of this disease, we will change the destiny of the child. He will keep being a uh, diabetic, uh, diabetic patient. But uh, the cause of diabetes will be very mild, with no complications at all. The results are not effective in 100%. They are effective in 70%. But in cases of uncurable diseases, it is something. Wrapping up my three-year journey investigating this story, I tend to take greater notice of the millions of people around me. We certainly have no shortage of human beings especially when I see homeless people sharing the same space as millionaires. We are clearly still struggling to take care of the people that are already among us. The human race collectively aborts up to 50 million fetuses every year, whether we agree with abortion or not. It doesn't matter if we are pro-life or pro-choice, we are going to do nothing to change the hard reality that people are going to continue to seek abortions, especially when 22% of all pregnancies in the United States end in abortion. The argument that women will start getting pregnant on purpose just to have an abortion to provide more fetal stem cells is, well, absurd. No woman wants an abortion unless that abortion is absolutely necessary. And if she does choose that path, how is that decision any of our business? So, uh, what do we have to say about all this? Except all I can say is we're not going to see this technology available to the Americans anytime soon. Between the anti-abortionists that do not want to see this happen and the pharmaceutical industry that will take full advantage of that and not allow this to happen. This is probably the biggest threat to anything the industry has ever seen. So many people ask me how I am doing on the therapy. And frankly, I feel amazing. I can't really speak for Stem Cell of America so much as MSIP. Um, as I was sort of rushed in and out, 30 minutes, no medical testing. I did blood work before and after. Nothing significant changed in my health. But with MCell, I had a full ultrasound that showed, showed a slightly in, uh, enlarged pancreas, and that normalized in only four months, completely normal. My cholesterol was really, really high uh, on my, based on my blood tests, but uh, not anymore. Four months later, my cholesterol normalized. You can't do that without pharma drugs. So um, it's pretty remarkable. It is my hope that everyone I know, including my loved ones, get a chance to get this therapy. But perhaps the most noticeable thing that happened to me that I experienced shortly after the cells was, uh, aside from like skin things clearing up, I slept better, uh, energy increased dramatically, but my libido exploded, absolutely exploded, like an 18 year old again. And uh, that's not reason enough. So I feel quite privileged as I'm only one in 15,000 people across this whole planet who have had fetal stem cells. And you can't film? All right, all right. Thank you. No problem. No problem.